In early 2013, two major action games were released almost back to back that begged to be compared. Both were major departures from long established classic franchises. They both featured sword wielding protagonists who were written very much on the edgy side of cool. They both have you climbing a skyscraper full of officers to fight a bald man. Uh, they both have social media reaction scenes and they both close off with a tease for a follow up that will probably never happen. At the time though, for one reason or another, it was much easier to look at Metal Gear Rising Revengeance in a more positive light than the Devil May Cry reboot DMC. As a cool gamer myself back then, I was definitely in this camp of coming down hard on the changes made to Devil May Cry while praising the new ideas in Rising. But six years later, the world has changed substantially, as has my relationship with these two games. So far removed from their release, how do they compare now? DMC's major handicap was that it was a game attempting to reboot the beloved Devil May Cry series by resetting everything with a new world and cast of characters. And let's just say that the results were a little less than well received. Desiccated squirrel semen. Metal Gear Rising is technically speaking a non-canonical game that continues on from the same world as Metal Gear, but as more of a what-if affair. So gamers get to play as an established character in a new story that lets loose with new ideas while not trying to overwrite any previous classics. Devil May Cry has also always been an action series while Metal Gear was traditionally stealth. So while all of DMC Devil May Cry's shortcomings and snafus could be immediately highlighted and compared to the amazing games it was following up, MGR got to stand alone and be analyzed as its own unique experiment within the Metal Gear franchise and considering some of its novel mechanics, even in terms of the entire action genre. Devil May Cry fans, unhappy with the changes to DMC, were obviously looking for something more likable in the action genre to fill the gap, the mechanically and thematically underwhelming DMC DMC was unable to fill compared to what came before, and thus flocked to Metal Gear Rising. But now that Devil May Cry has returned to its original world and mechanical prowess with DMC5, and after more than half a decade on and off replaying DMC, DMC and Revengeance, I can say that I honestly find myself going back to the Devil May Cry reboot on far many more occasions then I find myself booting up MGR again. And that's because on the whole, mechanically speaking, I find DMC DMC just a lot more fun and compelling to experiment with. Sure, it's not as mechanically complex as DMC 3 or 4, but it's still based off the great mechanics those games were built on. Jump cancelling, timed parry attacks, weapon switching on the fly, aerial combos, there's even a few exclusive elements to DMC DMC, like a timed dodge that buffs your attacks, or the ability to start a combo with one weapon and finish it with another, that gives it some of its own spice. Metal Gear Rising, on the other hand, despite its cool gimmicks, has considerably less polished combat. The free cut Zandatsu mechanic where enemies get launched in the air and you can manually slice and dice is a novelty on the first playthrough. It's perhaps enough of a unique idea to distract from the fact that the rest of the mechanics are serviceable at best. A lot of them are pretty basic and undercooked, and in some places, I gotta say, implemented straight up badly. Dante's various attacks in DMC DMC benefit from fairly standardized inputs and distinct animations that make them effortless to remember and make it easy to tell at a glance what effect each one will have on the enemy. Each weapon has one combo where you mash the button and another where you pause after the second hit to end your string with a different attack. Performing either of these in the air with different weapons also usually elicits different results. Double tapping forward with each weapon also performs a distinct move across all weapons. Each weapon has an alternate attack on another button, which again has a different effect on the ground or in the air. Holding either of these attack buttons will also elicit a different response depending on the weapon. All of this being fairly standardized across the board makes it very easy to immediately get to grips with a new tool because of the consistency. Like in other DMC games, if you think you've forgotten a certain move from a given weapon, it's easy to quickly go through the usual input suspects until you stumble upon it again. But keep in mind, this doesn't mean every weapon just has the same attacks across the board. They all use similar inputs, but the result of each input varies from weapon to weapon. With this all being so easy to remember, the challenge comes from timing these moves, combining them at the right time with the right positioning in interesting ways, and working other elements such as guns, the grapple abilities, jump cancel, and demon evade into the mix to cause the most damage. It's also immediately evident what the benefit of 
of doing each move is, and as I said, what effect other than damage it will have on the enemy. A move might send an enemy into the air, down to the ground, bring them towards you, bring you towards them, etc. This is what I think has made most of the Devil May Cry games easy to learn and hard to master. Rising's dial combos are a little harder to get down. The few that are here all blur together a little with stuff like YXY, YYXY, YYYXY, Y pause XY, etc. So off the bat, there's a little more memorization involved to perform these rather sparse few moves that ultimately affect combat much less than the moves in DMC DMC. First, you'll have to figure out what effect, other than inflicting damage, each move will have on the enemy, and therefore why it's worth doing over just hitting X. Not made entirely easy when unlike DMC DMC, which features handy video demonstrations for all its moves, Rising just offers up some rather unhelpful stills. Problem is, once you do figure out what each chain will elicit, it becomes apparent that the different combos in Revengeance seemingly have way less consequence within the title's overall gameplay. And practically speaking, I don't think you're gaining all that much committing them to memory. Depending on the combo, you can maybe get a foe in a bit of a different position at the end of a chain to Zandatsu them in, or you can get slightly more damage on a bigger foe if they're stunned in a slightly different way. But there were not really many game changer moments where pulling off a combo really changed the tide of combat or formed part of any grand master plan to perform on my enemies in the heat of battle. While in DMC, outside of just flaunting your skills, there are very practical reasons why you'd want to get an enemy to a certain part of the fighting arena. Grouping enemies together for one smash can save time or help you deal more damage at once. There might be environmental damage you want to move a foe towards, or you might get a demon evade and want to pump that damage buff into a bunch of nearby foes. In Rising, it didn't seem like there was too much of a practical reason to slam a guy into the ground or have him a bit sideways when the combo ended. The combos could look kind of cool, so there's no reason for them not to be in the game, I guess but the extent of the depth that combos can provide to an action game felt underutilized. The fact that Rising goes as far as to include a dodge offset that lets you pause a combo and continue it after a dodge is a nice inclusion, but it feels like kind of a bit of a waste on such little substance. DMC, DMC, and plenty of great action games incentivize constant varied performance with on-the-fly performance tracking. Giving fast, up-to-date metrics on what to do right in combat in exchange for upgrade bonuses while nudging the player in the direction of strategies that might elicit practical results too. Harder to ascertain what's worth doing, both practically or to receive upgrade bonuses in Rising, with its much more bare-bones on-the-fly hit counter and feedback sheet only received after a fight. All of the moves and Rising are kind of eclipsed by the power of the parry and Zandatsu, which again on the first playthrough was super exciting and cathartic to use. Slicing and dicing an enemy with precision in slow-mo and grabbing their guts out has a absolute oomph to it. But on repeat, it does end up boiling down to a quick mini-game you have to do over and over to maximize efficiency after each kill. That you know, can wear out its welcome a bit. While in DMC DMC on repeat playthroughs, I found myself having more fun than before, experimenting with the surplus of moves gained by New Game Plus to create interesting results. There are a few experiments to delve into in the combat of Rising, but they all involve accessing the awful inventory screen. Say what you want about DMC Devil May Cry, God knows I have, at least it had the bare bones feature that is letting the player switch weapons on the fly. Raiden unlocks three other weapons to switch out his heavy katana attack for, but getting them out is so cumbersome, it heavily cut down on my willingness to experiment, especially when I lose most of my sword combos when doing so. Weirdly, the pole arm spear thing does have various moves with similar inputs to the sword, which means there are some transferable skills there. But the other two unlockable weapons are so bare bones, they feel like they're in beta almost and do not present a substantial amount of moves in their own right, I think, to justify having to pause the game to switch into them. The electro side that can pull right in towards enemies seems so primed to be switched in and out on the fly with the heavy sword moves and even other weapons to do crazy air combos and such that it's staggering you have to stop everything you're doing, go on the ground and pause the game to access it. Just allowing Raiden to switch to this Psy on the fly alone would increase Rising's depth by a huge amount. DMC also stays way more true to classic 3D action of old, lacking the kind of button prompts and quick time that most action games of that era had. No moments where you have to shake the stick to break free from a grab or stun, which 
gets aggravating in Metal Gear Rising. I've probably said this before, but I'll say it again. You should be punished for getting hit, but losing health should suffice on that front, I think. Because winning from that point on has just been made harder with less health remaining, and I will have to prove I'm skilled at the combat to win. Whereas shaking a stick when hurt to keep playing is punishment, but not much of a test of anything other than how prepared I am to tire my thumb out. Rising's lack of depth in some departments is seemingly made up for, at least on a challenge level a bit, by having pretty aggressive aggressive enemies compared to something like DMC DMC, especially on higher difficulties if you botch a quote-unquote stealth segment. So its rapid-fire frantic hordes can lend a satisfying, constant, kinetic energy to the fights when not being grabbed by the analog stick. DMC DMC stumbles when it comes to color-coded enemies that limit the moves you can perform on them to only two weapons, and are so easily hit-stunned it becomes a very tiresome button-mashing exercise eliminating them. They might as well die on the first hit rather than the 20th if I'm only given access to a fraction of my toolset to experiment with on them. Color-coded enemies can force the player into new strategies if there's two of different colors present at the same time. But one on their own is a real drag. On the whole though, DMC DMC offers far more to play around with in the long run, far more moves and ideas to try out with less flow-breaking shallow interruptions, plus more incentives for creative play through its breadth of distinct versatile combat mechanics and real-time feedback. With all this in mind in early 2013, why did MGR get such praise for its gamey mechanics, while the more competent DMC with its even gamier mechanics got dogged on quite hard. At least from the community, from what I saw, the journalists seemed to be in a bit of a different camp. One major reason it was easy to praise Metal Gear Rising's gameplay over DMC was that back in 2013, when both these games launched exclusively on consoles, before each title was released on PC, DMC's flashy visuals and complex environments forced it to run at 30 frames per second, while Revengeance came running out of the gate at 60 frames per second, or at least trying to reach that number. It was much, much smoother. Seriously, I was so unused to modern console games running at 60 frames by that point that booting up the demo for Metal Gear Rising on PS3 was a shock to the system, and supporting MGR and its decision to go 60 FPS over a game that dumped smooth gameplay for flashy visuals felt like the right move to hopefully get this standard reinstated, and I still think it was the right move. Later though, DMC got released on PC and on next-gen consoles at a smooth 60 FPS. If you play it today, you're likely not going to be playing that original release. So while DMC DMC gets to keep its extravagant visuals and be playable at 60 FPS and beyond now, Metal Gear Rising has no edge in that department anymore and is just left looking a bit visually bland and unappealing. If we want to be super critical, DMC DMC has uncapped frame rate out of the box on PC while the PC port of Rising is stuck at 60 FPS by default. DMC got experimental with a lot of creative, abstract level designs, playing around with color, sometimes well, sometimes not so much, but for every level that looks a bit whatever, there was another that I wouldn't mind spending some time in. Outside of the cherry blossoms, what does Rising have though? A sewer, a grey city, a desert town, desert warehouse. The big lift that you fight waves of enemies in. Great. My favourite. Even Raiden's design is super cluttered and not that appealing to me. I usually stick to playing Rising with the MGS4 looking outfit. Though it goes without saying that DMC DMC has some character design oddities too. In DMC3, you can immediately tell the twins are supposed to contrast against each other. Bright blue, bright red, swept back hair versus a fringe while the twins in DMC DMC clothing-wise are dark blue and kinda grey, respectively. Crew Cut and Fedora? Okay, that one checks out. The DMC reboot has the odd, truly ugly grey-looking segment, but that's intentional, I suppose, as a contrast to the much more colourful limbo dimension Dante spends most of the game in. In Metal Gear Rising, though, a lot of the time, grey and lifeless is just the game world visually. In the seventh gen, I used to be of the minds that perhaps amazing visuals for a given game's time and good performance had become mutually exclusive. But now that doesn't seem to be the case anymore, and maybe it never was the case. I don't know. I don't know how to optimize video games, but maybe Rising could have run at 60 and still looked a little better. Uh, looked a little more visually appealing, at least in 
terms of artistry and color. I'm dogging a bit on Metal Gear Rising here, but I think on the whole, it's still a better game than DMC Devil May Cry when taken in its totality, because it has sufficient highs to outshine the really bad stuff. And when we're talking highs in MGR, we're really talking the boss fights, right? <laughs> This is when Rising truly shines, insanely creative and epic confrontations with cyborg foes boosted by an amazing dynamic soundtrack, with lyrics kicking in at just the right climactic moment to perfectly drive the momentum of the fight to insane heights. Overall, they are amazingly well directed and make you forget that moments earlier, you might have gotten a kind of crappy level. Metal Gear Rising's pacing is shot to shit halfway through. You get four nice regular sized levels and then everything falls apart. With you redoing half an old level, a level that's just a boss fight, and the final level, which is just one hanger, and then the final bosses. This is actually one of my biggest sticking points with MGR. The final level of this insane action romp should be some kind of epic mega stage where Raiden has to tear through some crazy ultimate stronghold, right? Not like two minutes at a tiny base. But again, the final boss is so good, you kind of end up forgetting that. You have janky levels like the section in the office where you have to stealth around and find fuse boxes and walls or risk getting bombarded. But the fight against Sundown and just afterwards is so satisfying and climactic, I only remember this section happens when I think about replaying months later and then choose not to. With DMC DMC, you don't get any really, really bad lows, but you don't really get any highs either. Most of the bosses mechanically feel either a bit simplistic or a bit constrictive. Conceptually, they seem like they're trying their best to shock you or gross you out, but in doing so, they fall a bit flat as epic confrontations to punctuate the game with. Failing to come across as serious threats or respectable opponents, the way Rising presents its end-of-level showdowns. Bob Barbus visually is probably the most memorable fight, but conversely the most simplistic. Hit a button and then bash him in the face, repeat. The only moment I'd call hype, and we should have hype in an action game, is the Virgil fight, but that gets undermined and eclipsed by being an underwhelming version of a moment the series already did better before. This in general is kind of an issue with DMC DMC and why it's easy to dog on. A lot of what it does right, like the combat, was done better by its predecessors, while Rising gets off a little easier on that front, with nothing else like it to compare it to in its franchise. But even then though, Metal Gear Rising does find ways to bring back elements from prior Metal Gear games and build on them in an action context. Metal Gear Ray returning, but now you're grabbing its wing, slicing it down the middle, running on the missiles it's launching? That's how you bring Metal Gear into a pure action game. DMC really lacks those exciting little snippets, those really cool, memorable sequences, really well-directed bits of animation that punctuate a fight, that they get you excited you're playing an action game. When you're finding a boss and it cuts to something important, it's really a bit slow and clumsy. While MGR has quite a few insanely well-directed, context-sensitive moments that weave in and out of gameplay for maximum adrenaline. In comparison, DMC DMC comes off anemic in that department even when it tries its best. A lot of it comes down to direction and animation quality. Compare the impact and crunch of impaling the final boss in Rising to flaccidly landing the final impalement in DMC DMC. I will admit, though, that I do like the bit where all the debris falls and Dante is just like, oh, I'm, I barely noticed. Rising manages to sprinkle in and escalate its payoff super well. Every regular enemy can be Zandatsu'd when about to die, so finally getting a boss in the same position at the end of a grueling battle feels so good. You've knocked them down to size. Everyone working on the same rules. Pulling out the final boss's innards and crushing them like any other commonplace enemy has a similar effect. And of course, it goes without saying that using Metal Gear Excelsius' own arm for the ultimate Zandatsu near the end is the perfect over-the-top climactic repurposing of that mechanic for the final moments. 
Both games have its awkward cutscene moments, though. But who am I kidding? Scenes where Dante is trying to act cool don't quite hit the mark. Sometimes he can be a little silly and fun. I'm taking you off the air. But other times when trying to be cheeky and irreverent, he comes across childish and obnoxious. Which isn't great when the game is asking us to think his banter is badass. Oh, you? I'm your prime date, you ugly sack of shit. While his outlook on humanity develops throughout the game, at no point do we get an indication his dead bants have. Fuck you! Fuck you! We're meant to assume, I guess, that aspect of his character was always on point, when, uh, I don't know if it was. Honestly, though, in retrospect, Dante being a bit of a douchebag isn't really what hampers the adventure so much for me. At least he's still a cocky guy fighting back against overwhelming demon hordes. I could probably still get into embodying this Dante during the game if his opponents were more hateable than an awkward insult from him can be. It's the rest of the cast that really ruined things for me, I think. The villains being so inconsistent and all over the place, like the flip-flopping new Virgil, or such goofballs like Mundus, Mundus, bring down how climactic Dante's revenge against this game's version of Mundus and his forces could have been. But Revengeance also features some puzzling scenes, like when this guy shows up for the first time, introduces himself then and there, My name is Monsoon. And after two minutes has Raiden questioning his whole life and regressing, developing, it's not too clear, into a whole different split personality he can use to get super strong. Yes is a wake-up call to what I really believe. What I really am. What are you saying? I'm saying Jack is back. This is really one of the story's biggest low points for me. It's overdramatic with Raiden asking his backup to turn off his pain inhibitors so he can feel the pain. Turn off my pain inhibitors. What? <laughs> Madness. Even Sam doesn't know what to make of this. If Raiden had to realize he enjoyed the killing like he does here, which, which isn't necessarily a terrible plot development, I don't think it had to be done in such a goofy way. Now you're just being nasty. <laughs> it's more the execution than the twist itself, especially when one of the major catalysts is this guy he's known for two seconds. How easily you ignore the loss of life when it suits your convenience. Raiden is an established character we've known for years who's seen a lot and done a lot. It's disappointing to see him get tipped over the edge by some grinning money-making merc who just showed up. When Rising gets a little bit awkward, though, it's balanced out by a lot of the charming cheekiness and levity. It's much easier to forgive some corniness when your protagonist acts like this. Adios, amigos. Instead of this. You ugly sack of shit. The game gets pretty dark with child soldiers and child organ trafficking, so I don't know if the balance between light and dark completely works, but it makes the game come across far less pretentious than DMC DMC, which has very little levity to it and wants its kind of shallow story to be taken super seriously. Overall, aside from a few moments here and there, Rising totally eclipses DMC DMC in terms of story and narrative, and especially in how they tackle their themes of power and society. Demand for PMCs is about to skyrocket. The good old days after 9-11! Rising is an overtly very political game. The game's final boss is an extreme libertarian-esque senator called Armstrong. Every person in this nation will control their own destiny. A land of the truly free, damn it! A nation of action, not words, ruled by strength, not committee! Where the law changes to suit the individual. Not the other way around. He wants to tear down the current status quo by any means necessary, even if it means harvesting the brains of homeless children. I'm using war as a business to get elected! <laughs> so I can end war as a business. He wants to create an America where the strong rule, everyone gets to fight their own battles, and aren't held back by laws or the government's ideology when achieving what they strive for. The weak will be purged. And the strongest will thrive, free to live as they see fit. They'll make America great again! This is a system that has already started to creep into the world of Rising. The game introduces the concept of private law enforcement, allowing the powerful to create their own little armies to use the weak to tread on the weaker. You take advantage of their weakness. Of course they get hurt when you set them up as your human shield. 
Kill or be killed, Jack. Ultimately, Raiden defeats and kills Armstrong, but in doing so, partially legitimizes the senator's beliefs. But at least I'll leave a worthy successor. Raiden, a rogue operative who fights for what he believes, regardless of the consequences or the law. Military cyborg, you are not licensed to operate in this area. You're in violation of state and federal law. Guess you'd better arrest me then. Is the one who kills Armstrong. I won't sit by while they butcher little kids and ship their parts around like meat. It's sick. It's not all so simple, right? They import those brains legally. For medical purposes, it's all done. Being legal doesn't make it right. Corroborating his belief that a man should be able to fight for what he believes, regardless of the government. Raiden takes a worryingly similar approach to his opponent when it comes to seeing his ideals through to the end. The irony is here that only a stronger person was capable of stopping someone who believed only the strong should get what they want. It's a triumphant yet uncomfortable victory as you protect the weak while in doing so, somewhat validating the ideology of a madman. Deep inside, we're kindred spirits. You. And I. Meanwhile, the final boss of DMC DMC is your brother, who just forgot to tell you he planned on taking over the world. Free from the demons. The path is clear for us to rule. What did you just say? Uh, so you fight, and then he leaves. He just leaves. The end. The DMC reboot is a game that wanted, in theory, to tackle more mature real-world themes than its predecessors. By having the demons in this game be business owners, the proprietors of biased media, and purveyors of unhealthy drinks. But ultimately, it doesn't really explore these themes that much, or reflect our world really in a relatable way. Yes, by close of trading Friday. Should you fail to comply, the collapse of the economy will be on your head. I will make sure that you are stripped of power, shamed, and hated. You have a good night, Mr. President. Greedy rich people who control the interests of politicians, lying media that purports to inform its audience, or glossy inviting adverts that are trying to sell you products that are bad for your health, these things exist in our world and are really bad, but why do they exist, and why do we live in a world rife with them? How have we gotten to the point in the real world where they're the status quo? I can tell you now, it isn't because the ones in charge are all secretly evil demon fantasy monsters predisposed to evil, like in DMC DMC. If that was the case, the world would actually be a lot simpler. Rising presents a world more true to life, where the answers aren't so simple. Laws protect bad people, not because they're enforced by evil fantasy monsters, but because it keeps an economy of war chugging along that let a lot of people live comfortably while others suffer. What do you know about the weak? You weren't born poor. You've never been hungry. You don't know what it's like to fight and steal and kill just to survive. But you did survive! sheer force of will, following your own set of rules. With your own two hands, you took back your life. And now, I'll take yours. The masses are tricked by a madman, but a madman with a philosophy that he argues for, one that obviously favors him, but that is intended to pull the rug out from under the insipid and those comfortable to live a meaningless existence, thanks to the war economy the less fortunate fight and die in. Fuck American pride! Fuck the media! Fuck all of it! How do we justify killing and breaking rules to stop those who are killing and breaking rules? How do we do that without stooping to their levels or validating the violence they perpetuate? That's still something that humanity hasn't agreed on. Rising poses significantly more interesting questions and explores more complex subject matter than it probably had to do for an action spin-off when people probably would have been happy just to get to chop things up as Raiden. While DMC DMC's shallow themes are only so egregious, I feel, because it decided to retool an entire franchise and its world to explore them, but it ends up exploring them at a pretty surface level. It decided to be about some real-world social issues, but doesn't really explore them beyond 
demons did it. It makes the change to the Devil May Cry series come across as pretentious, and I mean that in the most unhyperbolic use of that term possible. In the pantheon of action games, DMC Devil May Cry delivers far above average mechanics, and if I was stuck in a room with just the gameplay of either of these two games, I would probably play it over Rising. I think a lot of us probably dismissed it a little more than it should have been, but it's easy to see why for the reasons discussed already here, and also for the fact that even when judged on its mechanics in isolation, its predecessors already offered a more complex and rewarding experience, making it feel fairly obsolete, even with blinders on for everything but the combat. That goes double now that a new Devil May Cry exists and is both deeper mechanically and has a great story, characters, and worlds to enjoy too. Rising deserves a lot of credit. It had a troubled production. The fact that Platinum stapled it together at all after Koji Pro dropped it is commendable, especially with such fresh ideas such as the dynamic music and getting the complicated free slash Zandatsu stuff from the original Rising demos to work in a completely new game and engine. But while I thoroughly enjoyed it the first time around, it's nowhere near the list of action games I choose to replay these days. It's a shame we never got a follow-up that refined the game mechanically, because if we did, maybe I would be here reminiscing about the charming first step a Raiden action series started with and not lamenting what could have been if things had gotten to be improved on one day. Well, who knows? Never say never. For now, I think our journey back into 2013 isn't quite complete. There's another action title released after these two you'd think would have a bigger profile than it does. Maybe it's time to take another look. The DMC reboot actually had some pretty good tracks too, but the best ones go underutilized, I think. Its version of Never Surrender gets the blood pumping and could have been pretty fitting as this Devil May Cry's main battle theme, but it barely gets any playtime. Considering the DMC reboot put so much effort into collecting its own vocal tracks, it's a shame they don't get pushed to the forefront more often to punctuate intense moments like in Rising. They could have also used that track longtime DMC composer Tetsuya Shibata made that only made it into a TGS trailer. Um, that could have been cool too.